So, John Yates, thank you for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, Sean. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk today about how society is fractured, but we need to start here, I think, because I'm young and so I have a lack of historical context as to how bad things are or aren't right now, right? It feels to me like we're living in incredibly fractured times. Politics separate families, culture separates communities, and war and conflict literally separates countries. But how did we get here? Yeah, I think um, most of us tend to uh, feel that whatever moment we're living in is uh, unique and, uh, you know, it's a unique moment in history and everything leads here and everything's never been so bad or everything's never been so good. Uh, And unsurprisingly, you know, there's been humans for, you know, tens of thousands and thousands of years. Uh, Unsurprisingly, uh, we're not living in a unique uh, moment right now. And I find that kind of reassuring. You can actually see lots of patterns when you look back. Uh, And there are moments in our history when we are much more divided than we are now. And there are moments in our history when we are much more together than we are now. And so, you know, my my daughter, uh, one of my one of my daughters, at least, is 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 12. You know, in her lifetime, she's had uh, Brexit. She's had the Trump election. Uh, she's had about, I don't know, a million general elections. You know, she's got it's quite easy for her to think, oh, the world is just constantly falling apart. But if she if she was in her, you know, I'm 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 40 now. Remarkably, I don't look it, but I am. Uh, you know, in my lifetime, I can think of the minor strike. You know, I can think of the level of division that took place in this country. I can think of the uh, the battles the IRA were fighting uh, on mainland Britain. You know, I can think of the troubles in Northern Ireland, of course. You know, th- these are not. Um, we are used to having periods of division. What I what I think though is true is is that we're not in a moment right now that is great for its togetherness. And if you ask um, the average Brit, the majority now to say that um, our times feel particularly divided. And the majority of Americans think that their society is mainly or entirely divided. And while I'd say, look, this problem hasn't suddenly arrived, I think we are suddenly aware of it in a way we weren't before. And I think we it's time we should do something about it. But I think the best thing we can do is try and take a really long historical view of you know, what has happened uh, in human history. Where, when have we become divided and when have we come together? And that's our best way to try and work out how do we get out of the situation we're in at the moment. And so how did we get here? Yeah, so um, the, 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 most, the most important thing I think that, that, that we need to sort of grapple with is why do we divide at all? in the first place. And so, I mean, the, so the first thing to say is, I think we are a bit divided. Uh, and so I think the average Brit is right. So uh, why do I say that? Well, if we look at our social networks, look at our friendships, look at the people you've got on your phone that you might call in a crisis, most of us find that we are actually in a bit of a bubble. So uh, half of those of us who have got degrees have nearly entirely friends, only friends who have got degrees. Uh, The vast majority of those of us who are retired uh, have no contact with anyone under the age of 40 unless it's our our, our grandchildren. Uh, Half of us have no friends from a different ethnic group. That's true in the US and the UK. Uh, A quarter of those of us who voted to leave the EU don't know anyone who voted the other way, don't have a friend who voted the other way. And the same is true for those who voted the other way. (laughs) So we don't tend to mix that much uh, politically. But then the biggest divide of all in the country today is actually about class, is actually about income and wealth. So the the average barrister operating in London doing pretty well uh, would have to invite how many people around that they knew before they invited someone who was unemployed? 10, 20, 30, 100 people. They'd invite 100 people before they'd chance upon someone they knew who was out of work. So we do have a, we do have a divided society. So what's what's happened? How did we get here? The the first thing uh, to 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 notice is a lesson that a man learnt called Francis Evans. Francis Evans is a hero of mine because he became fascinated in the first job I ever did, which is door to door sales. And what Francis Evans did was he he followed 150 door to door salespeople knocking on doors and selling life insurance, and he was kind of curious as to what made you a good or a bad salesperson. He never really worked that out. What he worked out was something much more interesting. What he found is you are more likely to make a sale if the person buying voted the same way that you did. You are more likely to make a sale if the person buying earned the same amount of money as you did. You are more likely to make a sale if the person buying was the same height 
as you were. What Francis Evers discovered is we have this small bias. It's a small bias, but it's a small constant bias towards people who remind us of ourselves. I, I call it people like me syndrome. And at the heart of understanding why we've become divided, we have to start off with this, this slight bias that pulls us into groups of people who are quite like us. And is there a, a context in evolution that makes that sensible? Because this is something I find fascinating. I spoke to Professor Adam Hart, who uh, wrote a book all about how we have evolved in such a way that served us in the past and now doesn't serve us. And this seems like a perfect example of that, right? Staying in a tribe in the past made sure you stayed alive. Now it causes its own problems, does it not? Absolutely right. So people like me syndrome, and, and scientists call it something else. They call it homophily. There's actually like 39,000 academic studies that come to this same view that we have this slight bias. So, as I say, they call it homophily. I prefer people like me syndrome. But yes, it's it, it, where's it come from? It's it's got a, it's probably historically had a bit of an evolutionary advantage. What could that possibly be? Well, think of it this way: if you're if you're back in the the you know tens of thousands of years ago when we were hunter gathering. And you come across someone who you've never met before. Now, they may look a bit like you. They may be, that may be a sign that they're part of an extended family or part of your tribe. Or maybe they look a little bit different. What if you had an instant reaction to someone who seems somehow other that was to sort of step back, to pause, to go hang on a moment? That might well be a slight advantage. It might well get you out of there, just give you that nick of time to start moving. So that's probably where homophily has come from. It's probably that slight advantage of being able to be nervous, to be able to pull away. But in our modern society, it's not very, it's not very helpful. And it's a little bit like uh, the fact we love sugar. You know, for hunter-gatherers, you wouldn't come across lots of food all the time. So if you came across lots of food, especially high sugar food, just eat it all. Eat it all. <laughs> Fill your belly. Then you're going to be OK for the next 24 hours. Super useful. The people who are fussy eaters, they're not going to do so well. But for our modern day uh, human existence, it's not very helpful. If you're, you know, sitting on your backside all day, suddenly, you know, eating loads of sugar, not great. So these things often had this sort of historic evolutionary advantage. Now, the, the, the thing is, what's so fascinating is if you if you look at the sweep of history and I, I think you can sum up history basically in three stages, each of which begins with an F. So they're super easy to remember. You've got foragers. So, you know, hunter gatherers, people out there collecting berries, moving on, moving on, collecting food, moving on. Then you've got uh, then you've got farmers. So we spent most of our lifetime uh, as, as humanity, as foragers. Then we became we discovered farming and we started to farm and we settled down and we had uh, animals for the first time that we would actually uh, uh, you know, really you know, use as food that was stationary rather than being hunted. Um, and we had we started to grow wheat. So we farmed. And then the third period of history, factory workers. Uh, so we moved out of the, the farms, out of the villages, into cities and worked in factories. That, that is the great sweep of human history till about 100 years ago. Now, what you notice in each of those stages, societies are actually blooming good <laughs> at overcoming people like me syndrome. And this is how they do it. The best way to see it is to visit uh, northern Tanzania. So in northern Tanzania... On the, on the shore of Lake Iyasi is a, is a tribe called the Hadza. And the Hadza are hands down the most interesting people on the planet. And they're super interesting for two reasons. First of all, they're, they're foragers. They are this first F. They're foraging, hunter-gathering in the modern day. But that's not even the most interesting thing about them. The most interesting thing about them, Sean, is what they do once a month. So once a month, when the moon is gone from the sky, in the evening it's totally pitch black... They, they perform something called the apem. And the apem is basically a, a dance. And, and the way it works is, is like this, that, that had a, a bed down in roughly the same sort of area, a group of them, they'll gather together before they go to sleep. And the men will go and hide behind some, a group of trees nearby, say. And the first man will come out and he'll have a group of um, ostrich feathers on his head in a sort of headdress, black feathers. He'll have a black cape. He'll have a, a, a rattle in his, in his hand and he'll have a, sorry, a, a bell in his hand and a rattle around his, his leg. And he'll lead, he'll lead off in a, in a sort of rhythmic dance and the women join in and norm, often the children will join in too. And this dance they'll perform for two or three hours with different men leading it off and then they'll go to bed. 
and then they don't do it for a month, and then they do it again. And they've been doing this for thousands, tens of thousands of years. Why are they doing it, <laughs> right? This um, it serves no obvious purpose in their society. So it doesn't resolve disputes. It's not part of some religious belief system that they have. They don't really have an organised religious belief system. It's not uh, part of their economy. It doesn't help them to forage. So what on earth are they playing at? And a group of, um, anth- a group of anthropologists somehow got money to follow the Hadza for a decade. And they were well, absolutely amazing piece of funding. And they decided to track who do the Hadza trust? Who do they bed down near to? Who do they gossip with? Who do they share tools with? And, and what they found, and this is so important for us today, what they found is the Hadza are biased towards two groups of people. One is their close-knit family. So we might look at the Hadza, 6,000 of them, and think they're all one group. They're not. They're a series of different families. So their first bias is towards their smaller family. In other words, people like me. You know, bias towards people like me. But the second bias is stronger. The second bias that they have when it comes to trusting other Hadza is the people they've danced the Apem with. And what the Apem does is it throws Hadza together, not with people they picked, not with members of their own family, but with just a diverse group of other Hadza. To use our modern language, what the APEM does is it makes diversity work. It builds trust across these lines of difference. And what we need desperately in our society is something like that. Now, not literally that dance. And the the good news is, for those of us who don't like dancing, including me, is when you look at the sweep of human history, there's, there's lots of different institutions that do this. So when you're foraging, it t- does tend to be something like the APEM. When we were farmers, it tended to be something like uh, often a religious service. You see the rise of organised religion when we start to farm, rites of passage, feast days. These were big. These were a big deal. So like a, an average English person in the 15th century would spend one in every five days in a feast day. These are not like you know little <laughs> commitments. These are serious commitments. And then as factory workers, you see the huge rise of people joining clubs, joining societies, sending their children to school, not something that had happened before, going to a workplace. All these places, whether it's the APEM, whether it's the uh, the feast day, whether it's the factory working, or whether it's the school, whether it's the club, they all bring you into contact with people who seem different and they create a bond. And we, I call that type of institution the common life. And a great society is full of difference, but it has a common life, something that connects us together. And the sweep of history is that sometimes we have strong common life and sometimes they fade away. Sometimes they grow and sometimes they fade away. And at the moment, they're fading away. And that's how we're starting to become more divided. And so this is an interesting place to to get your assessment on uh, something which was explained to me around two years ago by Tom Harwood, somebody who knows all about the divisive nature of politics. He is now at GB News. Uh, he was at Guido Forks back then, who were um, great at finding political divide as a blog. Um, and he explained to me when I was having a similar conversation with him back in December 2020 that actually I have it all wrong because I have this vision in my short historical context that, as he put it, everything before the 2012 Games was fabulous and great. And then since then, we've had, as you said, countless elections. I mean, since I turned 18, I feel like I voted in an election every year. We've had the Indy ref, we've had the Brexit referendum, we've had Trump. Um, And he suggested, actually, if you zoom out even just slightly, you see that the year before the London Olympics was the 2011 riots in London. You zoom out slightly more, you have things like the Troubles. So, in your assessment with everything you know, following these tides that you speak of, how bad are things right this very moment? I think we're in a, I think we're in a divisive period of time, but I would date that from about sort of 1960, 1970 onwards. So, um, I, 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 what what we see if 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 you if you look at the common life that connected together our great grandparents. So when they were, when and I taught this like when people were factory workers, but it's obviously wider jobs than that. But what were, what was it? It was clubs and societies. It was people being basically manda- mandatory sending to the local school for 95% of children. Um, and people generally working at the local workplace. So you're thrown into a place where you're not picking who you're hanging out with. And in that, you bond and you connect. That has been declining since about 1950, 1960. So every generation 
since the end of the Second World War, 1945, every generation has become less likely to join a club or a society. Again, club society is so important because you tend to meet people who you didn't pick. You have people around for dinner, you have people around for drinks, you pick who you invite. You go to a club, you mingle with who's there. You also see an increasing uh, proportion of parents choosing where they send their children to school. Some of that's private school, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of it is actually people moving house to send their children to certain schools or select or using selection, various methods to get their kids into the school they want. It's, that's really good in some ways for schools, by the way. <laughs> but it means, again, we're choosing who we spend our time with. And the more we choose, the more people like me syndrome kicks in. And in the workplace, I mean, the workplace has changed so much over the last sort of 50 to 75 years. Nowadays, we do just expect more and more to choose where we work. Of course we do. And increasingly, graduates tend to work with our graduates and those without degrees tend to work with people without degrees. And there's some complicated sort of economic reasons why that's happened. But the core is, I'd say the last sort of 75 years or so, we've seen a fraying of the sort of common life institutions, these groups that tend to unite us. And I sort of think anything more precise than that is just random, random variation, whether it's the 2011 riots or the 2012 Olympics. What we're seeing is a decline of the bonds that tend to tend to connect us. It's interesting to think that it goes back to school, actually, because this is a connection I didn't make whilst reading the book. But I went to a uh, a school which was very oversubscribed at the time. I'm not sure what it's like now, but for like every one student who got in, nine or ten applied. It was quite oversubscribed. Um, and the school itself, who I have to name because it's the phrase they had, they would they would look at a behaviour of yours and they would say, that's not the Brook Western way. And they would almost teach you that you are different to the people from the other schools. And then, of course, through the uh, the exam outcomes, I imagine that school relative to its neighbour school had more graduates and therefore graduates work with graduates. And it's interesting that actually, almost through chance, when we're very young, we get put, in a literal sense, in a spreadsheet by someone in an office next to a bunch of people who then determine for the rest of our lives who are the people like me. And when you realise that that's so random, that's actually... um crazy to think that we're all we're all dare i say victim of random circumstance to an extent that then convinces us that we're like these people but not like these people yeah absolutely and i think this this, this stuff is complicated because what your school's doing there i think is a marvelously good thing in many ways you know they're creating a sense of or they're trying to create a sense of shared identity amongst a group of boys who might well although they may have some similarities could easily fracture I'm sure there were cases of people being left out and that most schools there are some problems with bullying at some times. A good school will create a shared sense of unity. You know, we are here to look after each other. We're in this together. That We have more in common than that which divides us. I think the problem is if the intake to a school is entirely of one type, then obviously that you can end up thinking that's the sole identity you've got. <laughs> the sole thing I've got in common is with these people and everyone outside. And so what you're you're gonna get me pushing on more and more here is ultimately we really need institutions that throw us and bond us together, but we need to be members of more than one. That the danger is is when you're in one little you know, I've my dad was a vicar, I've always gone to church. A lot of people say religion, religion is the cause of all our divisions. We need to stop Muslims going to their mosque and Christians going to their church and Jews go to their synagogue and then everyone will be united. That's not my view. My view is a place of worship, for example, can be a place where you meet people of different ages, different income brackets. You're unlikely to meet a non-Muslim at a mosque, but you might well meet someone who is 60 years older than you. But the thing is, if the only thing you go to is your, is your church or your mosque or your synagogue, that's a problem. <laughs> You've got to have more than that. And so if the school is entirely of one group of people and that's your only connection, then that's a problem. And so this is an interesting segue into uh, the story that you speak of in the book of the Eagles and the Rattlers, because I approached fractured thinking, I get it already, you know, people segregate themselves by the, the obvious characteristics that we all see and know about around us, whether it's age or race or religion. But what that story taught me, and maybe you can expand on this, is that actually we as humans have this remarkable ability to pick entirely conceptual things that then form part of our identity and then hold on to them very tightly. 
Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the, the story that you uh, you mentioned there, uh, Sean, is one of my favourites. And so it's it's about an experiment done by a, a man called Sharif, who, um, I mean, there's no way the experiment he runs would be approved by any university conducting experiments or research today. It would be sort of seen as completely unethical what he did. But it doesn't it doesn't cease to make it an absolutely brilliant experiment. And what what he did is he took twenty two boys who were all aged uh, 11 and um, and all very similar. So they're all white. Uh, they're all basically tested to be roughly the same level of IQ. They're all roughly from the same sort of income bracket. These kids are not, you know, naturally going to form into two different groups. They're very similar kids. And he, he, he signs them up to go away from home for a week. He doesn't even really tell the parents where he's taking them. It's an extraordinary setup. And he picks them up in two separate groups of 11 and they don't know that the other 11 exist. And he takes them to a, a state park called Robber's Cave um, and he, he drops the, the, the first group of 11 off in one part of the park and the other group of 11 miles away in another part of the park. And the boys are told uh, to, that they're the only kids there and they're to put up tents and they're to play games and they're to get to know each other. And they're also encouraged to come up with a name for their tent and their group. And so one group decides to call themselves the Eagles, and the other group decides to call themselves the Rattlers. After about a few days of these kids getting to know each other, uh, Sharif decides to introduce them to each other. And he thinks it would be nice if they played a game of baseball. And he sets up a game of baseball and gets them to play against each other. But one of the teams wins uh, twice in a row. And the other team don't like it. And they start to get cross, and they start to claim that the other team's cheated. And the boys have to be separated apart. But then in the night, one of the groups, I think it's the Eagles, gets up and decides that they're going to raid the Rattlers camp and they steal stuff and take it back. And then the Rattlers decide to raid the Eagles camp. And two more days pass until the boys are actually in proper violent fights against each other. And Sharif and his fellow researchers have to physically separate them. And Sharif, who was kind of interested in setting up this sort of conflict, is now panicking because it's got completely out of control. And the Eagles don't want anything to do with the Rattlers, and they hate them. And the Rattlers don't want anything to do with the Eagles. But you're exactly right. They, these children have so much in common. There is nothing that obviously divides them. But by putting them in two separate groups, and then introducing them not to do something nice together, but to compete against each other, they become, they become divided. Are there, I'm just thinking out loud here, based on your answer, so uh, bear with... Could we say that Sharif, the researcher, is analogous with forces at play right now in as much as we all have an incredible amount in common with each other? And yet, for at least the whole of my adult life, every year or so, there is a news agenda which tells us that it is for this reason now that you are different to the person down the road from you, right? Whether it is a referendum or an election or whatever it might be. Does somebody benefit from societies separating that's a great that's a that's a that's a great question and you know i think i think that you know we are we are primed for uh, uh for um to be worried about our own safety so if someone tells us a story about um uh, someone coming to get us or attack us you know we're you know we're interested <laughs> we're listening you know so you know there is there is a market um, for stories of division, for stories of baddies. You know, we have a natural interest in hearing about threats, because, which is useful because you can avoid them. So I think people can take advantage, absolutely. And, but the, the thing is that you're only vulnerable to those stories. So if someone comes along, I've got, for those of you watching this on YouTube, you can see I've got ginger hair, right? You know, I've got ginger hair. Someone, if someone came to you, Sean, and said, do you know what, Sean? You know, the problem with the world is it's gingers. Gingers are causing all these problems and they are they, they don't do any real work. They run all our banks and they're scumbags and they steal all the money and they take all our jobs. And there's actually a global cabal of ginger haired individuals behind everything. Now, I've basically just taken your know, typical sort of uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Islamic, anti-other tropes and just impose them on being ginger. No one's going to believe that story. It's ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? Because most of us know someone who's got ginger hair. And we think, there's no way. I know John. <laughs> there's no way he's in hock with all these other people with ginger hair. And all these people with ginger hair are mostly sort of 
as incompetent as I am, they're not going to take over the world. So the reason we fall for these stories is that when someone says, do you know there's, you know, 20 million Muslims in the UK, the reason we fall for this story and they're all up to something is when too many of us are not thinking, well, hang on, uh, Mo's not up to something. He's, he's a really nice guy. Lena's not up to something. She looks after my, she brings my kids home from school. You know, so it's, it's the lack of the connections that makes us vulnerable to some of these, uh, to some of these stories. And it's when we come together and do things together that we become so much stronger. So, you know, how does this Eagles and Rattlers story end to sort of prove the point? What, what Sharif decides to do, which again would never pass any ethical test of any experiment, is he decides to block all the water supply to the, to the campsite. And he tells the eagles and he tells the rattlers separately that the water uh, has got, the water pipes have got blocked and there's no water to drink. And the only way the eagles and the rattlers can solve this problem, because they're huge bags of sacks that he's put in the pipes, that he says some people have come and put in the pipes, is they have to work together. They have to work together to pull the sacks out. And then Sharif just takes advantage of the same approach. So what he then does, is he organises them to all go camping. But the tents are all mixed up and they've got to share the equipment to put the tents up. And then they're on the way somewhere and a truck breaks down and they've got to work together to fix it. And within five days, it takes five days of these little sort of tests that bond them together. It's time for the eagles and the rattlers to go home. And one of the boys petitions Sharif to say, we all want to go home on the same bus. Can you just get one big bus? And they all go home together. And halfway home, they stop and one of the rattlers buys drinks for all the eagles. What's happened is a huge shift in a very short period of time. How? Again, it's common life. It's people being forced, effectively, to do things together. And so I do think people will take advantage. But if we're thrown together, we're actually phenomenally good at building connection, of building trust, of turning division into togetherness. And then it's actually very hard uh, to spread these rumours. Do you think there is a danger that just in the same way that it's easy for kind of labels and semantics for one of a rare word to convince us that we are similar for words to convince us that we are different and there's a reason i asked this because it felt so bloody apt when i was in a hotel in swindon yesterday listening to the audio book version of your book um and there were these security guards sat in the corridor and my business partner and i all weekend were thinking oh i wonder who they're protecting i wonder what's going on it was this big intrigue um and then i asked at reception i said you know who are the security for um, and I believe the subtext of what I was being told is there were refugees in the hotel. And she said, bear in mind, the hospitality industry, incredibly diverse. There's a wonderful mix of staff in there from all sorts of backgrounds. And this lady's response was, oh, it's the Afghans. The kids run around. So we've hired security in. And I'm thinking, you're telling me that because you've labeled a child, quote, an Afghan, they now need security to stop them from having fun as a child because they've been given this them rather than us label. And it just, it felt so apt that as I was listening to your book, that was said to me and I thought, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Yeah. Lang language matters colossally. I, I was, I was struck when we, um, I mentioned my daughter earlier, when she was born, we went to, uh, we were in the hospital and um, I went to, I think, get my wife a, a glass of water and there was a sign um, up um, uh, where you got the cups and it said, um, uh, don't leave your do don't leave your cup here. It means the cleaners will have to deal with it. And I remember thinking it's such a small thing. I remember thinking it didn't say don't leave your cup here. We will have to deal with it. We'd welcome it if you didn't. It wasn't we. <laughs> it was them, the cleaners. <laughs> and I was just struck. Isn't that interesting? For me, it's the hospital and the cleaners are part of the hospital. But whoever put that sign up, it was important to them that I knew the cleaners are not part of the people who put the sign up. It's the cleaners. And language makes a colossal difference. There's a there's a brilliant experiment that I talk about in the book um, that um, uh, two, 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 two guys, uh, Mark Levine and uh, Stephen Riker did. And what they what they did was they got a they got a group of um, Man United supporters. I'm a huge football fan. I'm not a Man United fan, but I'm a huge football fan. And they, they get um, about 30 Man United fans and, and they line them up one by one. And they they say to them, uh, you know, welcome to the experiment. 
Uh, it's great to have you here. So they know they're taking part in something. And they say, look, before we run the experiment, could you just t- tell us a bit about yourself? I understand you're a Man United fan. Who's your favourite Man United player? What's the best Man United game you've ever been to? And uh, what do you, um, what, who, what player do you think Man United might buy? And they send the, then they say to the volunteer, would you mind just walking over to the, where the experiment's going to take place? It's it, that room, that building over there, about 300 yards away. Now, of course, the experiment actually takes place while the person is walking over. And as they're walking over, um, a, 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 another person, a, a bloke comes running past, and he's actually a member of the, 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 the research team, but they don't know this. And the guy comes running past, and he falls over. And the, the fan is, well, they're, they're meant to be over there, but this person's fallen over, they need help. And the question is, will they stop? Will they stop and help the guy up? Now, what's interesting is for 10 of the guys, so for a third of the people walking across, the researcher, when they fall over, is wearing a Man United top. And a third of the time, the researcher is wearing a Liverpool top, the arch enemy of your Man United fans. And a third of the time, they're just wearing a red top, which is the same colour as Liverpool and Man United tops. Sure enough... The, the volunteers are more likely to stop, be a bit late, do the kind thing, if the person is wearing the Man United top. You know, it's people like me. They're less likely to help the Liverpool fan and the red-topped person. Here's the interesting thing about language. The next day, they run the experiment again with another 30 Man United fans. They call them forward just the same. They talk to them just the same, but they change one thing. I understand you're a football fan. Who's your favourite football player? What's the best football match you've ever seen? What football player do you help is signed for the Premier League? Again, the people walk off. Again, someone falls over. Man United fan a third of the time, Liverpool fan a third of the time, red top person a third of the time. The results are completely different. What you find is the person is just as likely to stop as before for the Man United fan who's fallen over, but equally likely to stop for the Liverpool fan and less likely to stop for the person just wearing a generic red top. People like me syndrome is kicked in again, but it's kicked in with a different group of people. Language makes a difference. It makes a difference to who we see as people like me. And so does doing things together. So these two ways, the way we frame things and the way we spend our time, it doesn't remove people like me syndrome, but it changes who are the people like me. And that's 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 the whole ball game. Because if we can get people to see that actually those people we thought were other are actually people like me, then we can do what we've done throughout history, which is get people who seem different to connect together. And so an interesting theme throughout the first half of the book is this idea that uh, in the same way that the Eagles and the Rattlers bonded through a tough experience, we bond through challenge, right? It's the same reason why, at least anecdotally, people from the military will tell you that, yes, I'm close with my family, but the people I served with, I'm incredibly close with. There's just this bond that they can't quite articulate is one of the reasons why we in our comfortable modern society are so detached is because our lives are so comfortable. Are we a victim of the fact that actually in our day-to-day lives, we don't ever come across difficulty that requires us to communicate or work with others and therefore we stay in our bubble, we have our Netflix, we read our Daily Mail and we just stay on our own? Are we a victim of our own success in that sense? Yeah, so... It's a brilliant question. Uh, I, th- I think my ultimate answer is no, but it but it it is worth thinking about. And so the, the the reason why it's in first of all it seems absolutely right is you, you're absolutely right that people who serve um, and fight together feel a real bond, and that that and and often people um, will will find that they're serving in the, in the forces with people who are from all sorts of walks of life. So um, if we look, for example, at the US military, um, which was the first part of American society to become desegregated, and there's a great story to tell about how it became desegregated, but the first part of American society becomes desegregated. If you look at where ex-service men and women choose to live, compared to people who've never served, they are more likely to choose to live in places that are racially diverse. Why would that be? (laughs) And the reason it is, I'm almost certain, is because they've had a a tough shared experience with people from different ethnic backgrounds. And it's made them realise that people of different colour, not everyone, not universally, not perfectly, but has made them more likely to realise, oh, we've got quite a bit in common. 
you, these people are people like me. So when it comes to looking at a neighbourhood that's mixed, they're more likely to feel totally at ease about it and not worry about it. To, to sort of double down on the point, tough, intense experiences do bond us. So, you know, if we look at the, this brilliant, I think, story of how the US Army became desegregated in the first place. So um, I sometimes call this story how Hitler desegregated the US Army. So if you if you go to 1944, December the 16th, we're coming to the end of the Second World War, and um, the Allies have, have, have landed at D-Day. They've, they've got through, uh, they've done the Normandy landings, they're storming through France, and, uh, you know, Hitler and the Nazis are in trouble. Great news. And the, the, the Allies have st- are storming through France to the extent that they've actually, their line has got quite spread out. So their supply line is quite weak. Hitler's in trouble, right? He's, he's losing against the Soviets to the east, and now he's got the Allies in France. And so in a typical move, he decides to just do something completely uh, without any sort of sense of caution. And he gathers, he instructs his generals to gather 406,000 men. And he attacks completely madly. No one sees it coming because it's such an extraordinary move. He attacks the Allies' supply line, throws men at the front. And the Allies don't see it coming because it's such an extraordinary move. And they are panicked. And Eisenhower is the man on the ground. He is. He goes on to be president, but he is the man in charge of the Allied forces. And he can't work out. Uh, he can't work out what to do. The obvious thing to do, though, is to get more men to the front. The attack has begun. He's got to defend the front. And he calls to his officers, I need more men. I need more men to the front. There must be more men we can deploy. And they're saying, no, we've got that. It's all the men we can get to the front right now. We're just going to have to try and hold the line. And Eisenhower goes on saying there must be more men. And eventually he's told, OK, yes, there are more trained men who could be deployed at the front. Send them to the front. We're not allowed to. <laughs> what do you mean we're not allowed to, says Eisenhower? The reason they're not allowed to is those men are black servicemen. And the American army is segregated. So black servicemen are not allowed to fight alongside white servicemen. Same in the United States in the South at the same time. Segregation is the law. And so it applies to the army. Eisenhower take, makes a decision. This is ridiculous. This is not happening anymore. If those black servicemen are willing to serve on the front with white servicemen, they will be deployed. And so on that day, in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge, black and white servicemen fight alongside each other. And they go through an intense shared experience. They wear the same uniforms. They're treated in very much the same way. They fight and fear for their lives together. They march together. Now, obviously the battle is won and Hitler is defeated. Two years later, President Truman decides, I want to desegregate the entire army. And a poll is sent out to all the, all the servicemen uh, to ask them how they feel about the army becoming desegregated. And white servicemen are opposed. 70% of them say, no, we do not want the army desegregated, apart from one group. There is one group of white servicemen who feel completely different. 93% of them are in favour of the desegregation of the army. Who are those white servicemen? They are the men who fought at the front line for the Battle of the Bulge alongside their black servicemen colleagues and realised they had so much more in common than they thought. So shared negative intense experiences can give us this bond. The reason I don't think it's quite right overall is if you if you look across um, across across the, the, the world and you look at countries who are going through absolute crises, they don't tend to be more united. So, you know, if we look at places that um, have suffered from, uh, whether it's uh, from famine or from uh, serious financial uh, uh, challenges or from um, uh, uh, dictatorship or from obviously civil war, you know, these places tend to be heavily fractured. And so one of the one of the things that the research tells us, how do we bring this together? How, does, how do we make sense of this? Well, what the research tells us is intense shared experiences, highly memorable experiences bond us, whether they're negative or positive. Why? Because when we're asked, who are you, John? Who are you, Sean? You tend to think of those intense moments. They're what make up your life. I'm the person who ran the marathon. I'm the person who was there when my daughter was, was born. I'm the person who was there at my father's funeral alongside. And we tend to think of the people who were there with us. And we tend to think of those people as being people like me. And so those intense experiences create a sense of us. But one of the other things that helps to create a sense of us is a feeling of safety. 
that actually we feel safe with these people. And if you're in an environment that's full of uncertainty, unpredictability, insecurity, actually you're less likely to feel safe and you're more likely to be fight or flight and ready to run and the divisions become more acute, more real. And so then, in a sense, social media poses this paradox because on the one hand, we feel incredibly safe there, generally. Let's ignore the uh, the edge cases for a while. Um, in as much as we're shown what we want to see um, and that makes us feel good and we're validated. But then on the other hand, social media today is a place where once we are connected with those people that are very similar to us and share our views and look the same and speak the same, it is then the the group of platforms that allows us to make real world social plans to have those connections in person that we speak of so with those two forces at play and the erosion of real social clubs that once were this glue of society are we destined to to fall foul to these algorithms and just go down this slippery slope or is there a, a saving grace here yeah so i think it's worth saying social media is a challenge here right why is it why why is it a challenge? You know, I started off by saying we have this thing called people like me syndrome, this bias towards people like us. The thing is, the more choice we have, and the easier it is to choose who we connect with, the more we will tend to end up in these little bubbles. So the algorithm doesn't help, but our own choices don't help either. And social media, so it's much easier to choose to follow and unfollow someone than it is, for example, to change the school your child goes to or to change where you work, let alone to change where you live. And so we shouldn't be surprised that that ease tends to bring like minded people together. Um, but the, the, the case for the like we're doomed is quite easy to make, isn't it? You know, we used to have these clubs and societies According to John, they've declined and our, our schools are increasingly divided by income because we choose and we segregate and our social media is like turbocharged. People like me syndrome, we're divided. We're all doomed. I, I think that overdoes it. And the reason I say that is, again, let's take the broad sweep of history. So if we go back to I talked about the APEM, this wonderful dance that we used to do as foragers or some version of it we used to do. If we were if we were sitting around in sort of, you know, 8000 BC, having just started farming, you and I could say to each other, oh, no one dances the Apem anymore, Sean. We're all doomed. That used to bring us together. And now look at us. Now, the truth is that was actually quite a hard period in human history. And you can find villages that were actually abandoned because there was a lack of glue to bring people together. But we know now, looking back, something new turned up. You know, we discovered new ways of connecting, rites of passage, feast days, religious uh, celebrations. And our great grandparents, our great great grandparents, they didn't do feast days. Uh, they found something new. They came up with clubs and societies and schools and workplaces. Something new was invented. And so the way we should look at it is go, OK, what are we going to invent that's new? What's the new thing we're going to create that can connect us? But we know a bit about what it's going to look like. It's got to be fun. It's got to pull us in or we've got to be forced to do it. And there are ways to just design things that you could be forced to do. But ideally, it pulls us in. We want to do it and we don't choose everyone who we do it with. And so I think it's likely that at some point through social media, through the metaverse, through something, we'll find something that is like that. Uh, my slight worry is we need to get on with it. You know, I'm a bit bored of this divisive period we've been in for the last 40 or 50 years. And so I would quite like to get on with it. Um, and at the moment, there are not enough people really thinking hard about what could we create that's like that? Or how could we invest to make a bit of money to build something like that? Um, so we need to get on with it, but we can get ourselves out of this problem. And so what I want to do is focus on three of the core areas where getting ourselves out of this problem holds most benefit. They're three of the, I believe, five that you speak about in the book. And the first one is social mobility. So what is the, the importance of overcoming fractures to help us all with social mobility? Yeah, so um, it, it, we sort of know this one because we have a phrase for it, which is, it's not just it's not just what you know, it's who you know. And, you know, 40% of uh, jobs uh, come through word of mouth. You know, you hear about a job being advertised or you actually meet someone who's actually offering a job through who you talk to. And you're actually more, so you're not only more likely to get 
a job if you have a mixed up network rather than just one small bubble of people who don't know much about all these different opportunities the more mixed your networks the more diverse groups of people you tend to connect in with different ages different income brackets different education levels different ethnicities different ways of voting the more you like to hear about those opportunities but you're actually going to get paid more too (laughs) so people with more diverse networks across those different lines it's not just one type of difference i'm talking about here um I'm more likely to get a good opportunity and a higher paid opportunity. So if you want to get on, just thinking really selfishly for a moment, if you want to get on in life, it actually is worthwhile learning how to connect with people who might not initially seem like you. And so what about democracy, which almost seems to be the uh, the bed of all division recently? What, what, How can we come together in a more meaningful way to get more done rather than having these infights constantly? Yeah, so I mean, the the, the best the best um, uh, thing here is, I mean, I, we talked a bit earlier about like if you don't know anyone who's you know runs a small business, and someone comes along and says, oh, we can solve all social problems by just tripling tax on small business owners, you might not think, well, hang on, <laughs> you know, uh, my friend, uh, you know, my friend Becky runs a small business, she hasn't got that sort of money. This is going to destroy her business. Uh, so whatever issue it is, we when every five years the government effectively closes up. You know, all the MPs don't be, aren't MPs anymore. There is effectively, if you like, no democratically elected government for a day, and the power sits with you and me. You know, with our little stubby pencils in our little voting booths, and um, you know, my I I I grew up with people who would say of the prime minister, whoever it was, really. What do they know? I bet they don't even know the price of a pint of milk. I mean, I'm sure you've heard people say that, but he doesn't know the price of a pint of milk. Well, my view is he doesn't necessarily need to know that. What he does need to know is, does he know people for whom knowing the price of a pint of milk is critical because they're so struggling financially? Well, my mum always said, if you point the finger at someone else by making a point like that, there's always fingers pointing back at you. When I'm coming to vote, do I know people like that? Do I know a small business owner? Do I know what it's like to be a refugee? Do I know what it's like to be pushed down the housing ladder because of the arrival of a refugee? I'm trying to look at this from different angles here, but do I know these different types of people? And if I don't, you know, my ability to use my stubby bit of pen, pe- uh, pencil on a piece of paper is going to be much less good. You know, it's going to be much less able to make good decisions. And it's going to have less good options presented to us. And actually, even more than that, when we talk about politics, if everyone agrees, if you only talk about politics, with people who already agree, the trouble is, actually, your, your opinion doesn't really change. Well, it does change. It changes in one way. It becomes more extreme. One of the few things we know is that if you put a group of people who have the sa- roughly the same point of view together, they become not only more extreme in their opinion, they become more certain they are right. And that's what we're seeing. And it's very hard to make democracy work if actually you hand up with two or three big polarised camps who are at the extremes and there's no one in the middle. And the middle may well often be the best option. So if you want to, if you want, if you ever find yourself going, God, these options aren't very good when I come to vote or why can't the government just govern for most people? Often the problem isn't them. It's not our politicians. Sometimes the problem is us. And so, again, you know, if we want if we want a government that works, we need to get to know each other better. I think of another conversation that I had around the same time as I spoke to Tom Harwood. I had somebody on called Ryan Merton and our conversation was actually nothing to do with politics. He's just incredibly good at precisely predicting the outcome of things. And one of those things is politics. And what he puts that down to is that he was raised in, I believe, Burnley. And then when he was 19, he took a job in the city centre in Dublin and then he moved to London. And so he has these three very different groups of friends and he almost pulls on the opinions of those in uh, in all sorts of these different classes and identities to form a singular opinion. Now, not all of us are Ryan. Not all of us know these people immediately. Do you have any tips on how we can go about almost building that empathy by finding new people to speak to where where do we go to find new people these days yeah absolutely so look three things that i think all of us could do um that would be um that would be good on this stuff so um you know one is uh one is social media like social media is such an amazing tool like you know i use twitter quite a lot who are you who are you following like have a look at the last pe- 10 people who tweeted on your timeline if you're on twitter or whatever it might be do you agree with them on everything? If, if they have political opinions particularly, do you agree with them on everything? 
If so, mix it up. Like add some people, not not hate mongers. I don't mean like you know if everyone you everyone you follow is in favour of you know human rights. You should you know follow some people who want to kill everyone. Like but you know people who vote differently, people who vote you know really differently from you or think really differently from you. I my day job um, is. Um, is focused on reducing violence. You know, I spend a lot of time thinking and talking with people about what do we do to change society to try and reduce violence. I have to work a lot with um, a whole mix of different people from, on the one hand, um, small grassroots youth organisations. Uh, and, you know, a, a big subset of that will be black-led uh, youth organisations. And I have to work with the police and understand how they think and what's going on with them. Now, sometimes, on many things, those groups might agree. But on some things, they strongly would disagree and they'll see things differently. If I just follow people who are police, <laughs> I'll think about an issue like stop and search in just one way. If I only follow uh, youth workers, I'll think about that issue only in one other way. I need it's very good for me if I want to actually be an effective leader and an effective listener. I need to hear different points. So social media, mix it up. Second one, join something. Work for our great grandparents. Why not do it again? Join a club. Uh, find a club. Anything. If you don't can't think of a club, think of a hobby, uh, either one you've got or one you'd like, join something. Go four times. If you hate it, stop going and pat yourself on the back. You might like it. Keep going. But clubs are great ways to meet uh, uh, people who are just a bit different. The, 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 the third one uh, is invite your neighbours round. And many of us will have done this over the last few days. You know, um, once a year, invite some neighbours round. Uh, and you might say, oh, I can't fit more than three people in my house. H- invite three. <laughs> or I couldn't afford to cook everyone a meal. Don't cook a meal. Give them some lemonade. It doesn't matter. Just invite a small number of people around, but don't pick the ones that you really like. You can do something separately for those. Just pick randomly. Either pick people who are nearest, who happen to live nearest, or roll some dice and pick some people. And what's the worst that can happen? You can feel a little bit anxious. Um, but again, it's a great way to just connect with people. And again, it, this is all to try and help your life work better about connection for opportunity, connection for our democracy. It also, final one, it makes you less anxious. You know, one of the reasons we're becoming more anxious as a society is that we tend to, people like me syndrome is a slight anxiety about people who are different. Are they up to something? You know, am I okay with them? Will they reject me? The truth is humans are humans are humans. Some of them are horrible and most of them are lovely. (laughs) And so actually it's when we connect with people who are different that we find, oh, we've got more in common and our anxiety levels tend to tend to fall. And that's really good for our health. When our cortisol levels, which is what kicks up when you feel a bit anxious about the other, rise, uh, that can be quite bad for our for our heart, <laughs> for our um and um, for our general health, our nervous system, our digestion. But when it starts to fall, we live longer. We are happier, we are weller. Um so you know this is this stuff is good for us all around. There's an interesting trend for everything you've spoken about, which is that the evil in all of this seems to be people have been sold this idea that life is a zero-sum game. And if you allow somebody who is different to you to benefit, you are having something taken away from you. But it's not only that that's not the case, it seems to be that all of the research you've spoken about points to the opposite. Life becomes better and more meaningful and you have more opportunities and more chance to raise your income and you have better health you have more through connecting with others not just not less if that makes sense yeah yeah i think that's absolutely right i mean the um the i mean the truth the truth is you know there there are times in life where people you know anyone who's ever been a teenager at school knows that there are times when people do just cleat together and things can become a bit zero sum. Why? Because the groups feel a bit threatened. They want to make sure they've got their position. They want to... So we can end up in competition with each other. Yes, we can. But it doesn't have to be like that. And every game theorist, anyone who's done proper, you know, proper research about how to make society works knows that we're better off if we don't compete like that. So how do we get there? We get there by trying to reduce the boundaries between ourselves. So we realise oh, well, hang on, what's the point of competing with these people? They're my brothers, they're my sisters, I like them, they're like this. Oh, they're very similar to that. I'm going to see them next week at the synagogue. I'm going to see them next week at the football match. I'm not going to compete against them. And so it's, you know, that competition absolutely can happen and it's dangerous. But when we, it only starts to happen when we divide. (laughs) So let's not divide. Let's find ways to come together. And then we actually all end up, we all end up better off. 
there's the interesting, and I'm going to butcher this because it's been many years since I read it in a book, and I couldn't tell you what book it was in. Classic citation here. Um, but the tit for tat study, uh, the the original tit for tat game that was built by those researchers, and yeah. they came to the conclusion. Correct me if I'm wrong. That the only way that either the tit or the tat benefits is by not being the first mover to do something negative. So if they just implicitly trust their opposite number everybody ends up better off but the second one group makes a move that's when it descends that's exactly absolutely right and the the, the experiment I, I mean it's done in all sorts of different ways this experiment but the experiment often is that people have a certain amount of money that they've got to share between uh, each other um and um uh and if i offer you a very paltry amount of money uh, then you'll turn the whole thing down and we'll end up with none. Um, and the best solution is for me to offer you half and I have half. And then you'll accept it and I'll accept it. And then when we play a game, you'll do the same. We'll both end up never terminating each other's offers. So we'll all end up better off. But you're right. The best the best strategy um, is the one which says, I will trust you if you trust me. And that makes us all better off. But how does that trust happen? Again, you know, it, it happens because you're suddenly, you're in, you're in a divided group but you're like well hang on <laughs> no I know him I was um I was I spent a a, a year um on a on a program this was like 20 15 years ago and there were like 12 of us all from different walks of life and um uh you know t- 10 of us were um Americans or Brits and uh one guy Jawad was a sunny Muslim uh he lived in Pakistan um Jawad and I connected we were obviously different right he, he'd grown up in Pakistan. I grew up in... Oh, he spent most of his life in Pakistan. I spent most of my life in Britain. I'm a white guy. He's a brown guy. Um, he's a Muslim. I'm not. I'm a Christian. Like, we, you know, we're obviously different. It's ridiculous for me to say that we're not. But we, we got thrown together and we got chatting. And he started complaining about he, how he got so cross with people who said they were Muslim but didn't live out their faith. And I said to him, God, I get so cross with people who say they're Christian and don't live out their values at all. It really does my head in. <laughs> and in that conversation, we realised how much we had in common. And it wasn't by pretending we were the same, but it was in realising. And the thing is, you know, Joanna and I have talked a lot since. If, if you ended up with a world, a situation, you know, quite an un, unexpected situation where, you know, a group of Pakistani Muslims were thrown together with a group of, you know, Western Christians... And Jawad and I saw each other in the groups. The problem would be so much easier because <laughs> I'd go, oh, "That's Jawad," <laughs> and he'd go, "Oh, you should meet so and so." You know, these tit for tat, these 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 competitions are much less likely if we've got these connections. Uh, they diffuse, they build trust, they make life work better. So I want to end on something perhaps more optimistic than some of the doom and gloom I've thrown at you about our current climate, which is, um, so we're recording this, as you've hinted, on the day after the the Jubilee celebrations where strangers came together, where everybody had this this feeling of unity for one weekend. Uh, and then we're thrown into Monday's new cycle of Boris Johnson f- facing a confidence vote, and therefore we're watching um, a political party tear itself apart on the news today but if we just zoom out from the immediate news cycles that tell us that everything's terrible every day um, and look at the kind of broader strokes of the future what gives you hope what optimism can we pull from the work you've done to tell us that actually maybe we will be closer together one day yeah and the the, the and i think there's such cause for 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 hope and the the hope comes from knowing that we've been here before. You know, I, I don't know if you ever, if, I don't know if a computer, I'm sure this had the computer crashes on you. You're in the middle of trying to save a document, the computer crashes. If you realise, no, this has happened before. I know, I know how to fix this. <laughs> then suddenly your anxiety level goes from about 10 to about two. You're like, okay, this looks similar. We can get out of this problem. I know I do this and I do that. It's going to be okay. This is exactly what's happening right now. We had a common life that connected our grandparents and our great grandparents, clubs, societies, schools, workplaces. It's gone into decline. We have become divided. It's affecting our social mobility levels. It's affecting our anxiety levels. It's affecting uh, our democracy. Sounds bad, like the computer that's crashed. Great news. This is exactly what happened when things like the APEM started to die out. It's exactly what happened before when uh, the rites of passage and the feast day started to die out. And you know what? Humans found a new way to connect. We came up with a new common life and things got better again. We, we have solved this problem before. We can solve it again. 
but we do need to act. We do need to actually get on with actually find either getting involved ourselves or somebody somewhere needs to help work on what's the new what's the new thing that's going to connect us and i do think there's a role here for government well you mentioned you know politics you know we do need politicians to recognize that us coming together is about the most important thing they can possibly help us to do and whether that's through teenagers doing community service together which i'd love to see or we could have a national retirement service when people retire they get involved in their communities together or when people have children, they could be thrown together with people from different parts of town to just learn a bit about the child's brain and how they're developing. There's loads of ways that actually our, our government could help to connect us, but there's things we can do as well. And we've talked about some of that. So I, I do think there's a problem, but this has happened before. So if we got out of it, then we can get out of it again. Amazing. John Yates, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. I'm going to make sure the fractured How We Learn to Live Together is linked in the show notes below. If people want to head elsewhere to check you out, to follow you, where should they go? Oh, they can find me on uh, on Twitter. Uh, I'm at John P. A. Yates. Uh, so that's a that's a good place to start. Amazing. John, thank you so much for this. I've really enjoyed it.